oxygen, IV fluid, and medication administration. Have catheters ready. Have catheters ready. Okay? Because generally, what happens here, okay, anaphylactic shock falls, it's, although it's an anaphylactic shock, what's happening here is distributive shock. You guys remember what distributive shock is? With distributive shock, your blood pressure drops and you have vasodilation. So now the, the blood isn't being returned back to the heart. It pulls in your extremities. Remember that with distributive shock? Okay. So because blood isn't being returned and you've got blood le I'm sorry, uh, fluids leaking in the capillaries, they're going to also start to dehydrate. So we need to give them a catheter, and what it says here is a la large gauge catheter we can, where we can give them fluid therapy. We're gonna pump their vessels up with pepperonized water. I'm sorry, regular water. Saline, you guys ever heard of saline? Okay, so we are gonna continue to uh, flush their, their uh, <coughs> venous, uh, I'm sorry, their arterial system out with with water because we want to keep them hydrated. We want to keep that blood flowing. If they become dehydrated, remember your blood supply becomes very thick and viscous. It's not moving. Cooling, it's not moving. There is no blood return. Okay? And if so, you need to be ready to prepare a CPR. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so here's some other things that you, we need to uh, be ready to do. Okay? Uh, make sure that the patient is breathing properly. Remember the epinephrine and vasopressors uh, and things like that. Know where those are located because if the doctor or the nurse has asked for that, you know where to find it. Okay? And it's not simply just giving them a box. Open up the box. Get the vial out. Pop the top open and get ready to give it to them so that when you hand it over to them, they're ready to just drop the medication and just inject it. All right, here's uh, another important thing here. We're also gonna probably give them some antihistamines, such as Benadryl. Um, remember the aminophilin, the vasoconstrictors, uh, raised blood pressure drugs for reduced cardiac output. And then we're just, again, we're just going to stay with the patient, assist as best as you can, okay? It's pretty exciting, right? All right, this is what we talked about earlier. So not only, um, not only are these drugs giving, given during an anaphylactic reaction, but remember I said we can also give them, give them these uh, uh, certain drugs before they have a procedure, such as Benadryl. So this is something that we can give before to prevent any of these things from happening. We can also um, give corticosteroids. Remember the solucortef that we talked about? It's steroids, which reverses the, um, in, uh, what do you call it, the inflammatory process. Okay. The reason why I'm spending time on this, guys, is because what do you think is, where do you think you're gonna find that? Great sound. Great sound. Okay. So you've got antihistamines, such as Benadryl. You have corticosteroids, such as Solucortef and Solumedrol. Isn't the inhaler that's also a cortical steroid right now? Yes. Albuterol? Yeah, because the, what the albuterol does, it's, a, it's an anti-inflammatory. Okay? Inflammatory is that, remember, smooth muscle tissue, it becomes inflamed, it starts to constrict. So the albuterol Dilates. helps it relax. <clears throat> anti-inflammatory. So this is what solucortef and solumedrol are. Prednisone is another one. There's, there's really no way to do it. I mean, you can ask, because that's why we take a very thorough history. Because again, they can tell you, remember, when the allergic reaction is. And it's, it's an exposure to an antigen. So they may have been exposed to that before and nothing happened. So they'll say, well, have you ever had any allergic reactions? Do you have any allergies? Oh, no, I'm fine. Okay, so how do you screen them for that? There used to be a way, they used to say that if you just put the iodine on the skin, and if you break out, that is that was kind of the proof. But 
remember, on your skin, it's not going through your circulatory system. So even if it touches your skin, you may or may not break out. So there's no other way to do it unless you are introduced to the, the contrast media vascularly. And that's when you know whether or not, okay? So what we do though is like I said, most of the time if the patient's coming in for these type of procedures, they'll be pre-medicated before they come in. So even if they have no history of it, we're gonna give them Benadryl anyway. We're gonna give them solu uh, Solucortef or Solumedrol anyway. Now can they still have a reaction? They can still have a reaction, but because they've already been pre-medicated, it's not gonna be as severe. So we've controlled the severity of that. So either they're not gonna have it or we've controlled the severity of it. Yes? What is the time frame as far as, say somebody comes in, they haven't taken anything, you give them a Benadryl, what's the time frame from the time you give so them the we send them home. Okay. So we send them home. Because they should also have been medicated the night before. We want that in their system. Got it. <laughs> yeah. It's not so, just like popping a Benadryl no, so you're good to go. No, because the, the concentration of the Benadryl that we use and the solucortive that we use, it's, it's very concentrated. And if you were to get, give it to them right there, it may not come out. We don't want to do that. The medication that we give them the night before and the day of is still a little bit less potent. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that way it sits in the system immediately. Okay. These and the, the one we've got in, the, in our crash cars, they're very potent. We want them to be able to go home. <laughs> All right. So if you give them the Benadryl, then, like, let's say you give it to them the night before, like you're supposed to, they won't get the severe systemic reaction at all, or is they it may, still possible? They, they still may have a reaction. So even if you pre-medicate them, they may or may not. If they do, it's not going to be severe. Okay. Yeah, so they still may have a reaction, but it won't be as severe. Okay. Yes. Now just think of what would happen if we didn't give it to them. Yeah. Now it becomes severe. So the guy who passed away, was he premedicated or no? He was, yeah, he was premedicated. The guy, I mean, it was, this is, this is where we, it's like that one out of like every 10,000 patients who has a severe reaction. Wow. Yeah, the odds of it is very low. This is one of the reasons that people, they die after this procedure. Some people, you hear they died after the what did you say? The, the angiogram? Yeah. No, they usually die after the ang angiogram is because um, they weren't, it was a, their heart wasn't good to begin with. So they usually, you, you save them, but all, all you've done is you've just kind of prolonged their life, okay? But they still, their heart still may not be strong enough to recover and they, they die. Or it could be a complication from um, the, the stent or balloon because when you put a stent or balloon in the, in the patient's coronary arteries, you're causing what's actually a controlled trauma to the vessel. So how your vessel responds to that will also um, be indicate, indicate whether or not your survival rate goes up or it's gonna go down. But sometimes there are complications to the procedures, but it has nothing to do, I mean, it may or may not have something to do with this. I'm not saying that all of them aren't like this, but maybe, maybe later on there isn't enough anaphylactic reaction. But it usually happens when they're in the apartment, not when we send them to their room or send them home. Okay, any questions here, guys? Okay, so if they do have an allergic reaction, the copy of this report should be kept in the patient's diagnostic imaging file and kept in a log book with the patient's name, date, and lot number of the contrast used. Okay, so if they have an allergic reaction, immediately it's gonna be put in the patient's chart. So that way, if they come back again, that red flag is there, we see it, okay? We see it. We know that this patient had an allergic reaction before, so now the next time they have this procedure, we're gonna be a lot more cautious. A lot more cautious, okay? Now, the reason why you would also have a log book to write not only the patient's name, but you're also gonna put the type of contrast used and you're gonna write the date and the lot number. The lot number tells us, if you ever looked at any type of the items that you buy, there's always codes in the bottom of the box or on the side of a bottle. Those numbers tell you where the products were manufactured. So all you gotta do is just look up the number and it'll tell you exactly where it came from, where it was manufactured and where it was distributed from, okay? Because 
this is and this has happened before. You've had one person have an allergic reaction. Okay, I'm not talking about severe, just a, a minor allergic reaction. Then you do another one of these procedures two or three days later, and another patient has that reaction. Okay? And another one has a reaction. Now you're saying, okay, this can't be coincidental. Let's look at the lot numbers. When you look at the numbers, they all came from the same place. So it could have been just a bad batch of contrast media that the hospital received that's causing these allergic reactions. Okay? So then once we discover that, we're like gonna get rid of our supply, we're gonna contact the manufacturer and say, you know what, we've had three allergic reactions on this lot number. So they'll do a recall. Okay. All right, so after the procedure, this is also important guys, after the procedure, you're gonna keep our, the patient in the department for 30 minutes. Why? It may not be an immediate effect, but you can also have a latent effect. Okay, remember what I said. It may not be immediate, but can patients have a, a, a reaction later on? Yes, they can. So you're saying even if they don't have a reaction, you're still going to keep them there for 30 minutes? Right, we keep them under observation. Gotcha. Okay, it's just normal protocol. Okay. Instruct the patient, and if this happens, if they leave the department and they start experiencing these things, they need to contact the, uh, the hospital or go to the ER immediately because it can, it can go from very mild, moderate to possibly severe. But the longer that it takes for that person to have the effect, the chances of having an anaphylactic response to that drug or medication decreases. Okay. Any questions here, guys? Okay. Any questions on anaphylactic shock? Anaphylactic shock. Okay, let's talk about obstructive shock. Obstructive shock results from a pathologic condition that interferes with the normal function, uh, I'm sorry, pumping action of the heart. However, the heart may not have any pathological conditions. So in other words, the heart is okay. But something else is preventing the heart to pump out um, what do I call this? <coughs> the heart may be okay but there's something else that's preventing the heart from doing its job. Let's put it that way. So what we're gonna be talking about here is a pulmonary embolism, a pulmonary embolism or a PE. So basically what a pulmonary embolism is, if you, let me see if I have another slide here. Okay, pulmonary embolism. First, I'm gonna draw the flow of blood. Okay, so blood comes from the left ventricle, right? So you have blood in your left ventricle, your heart squeezes the blood out. Okay, is blood delivered through the artery or the vein? Artery. 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 Okay. Delivered by the artery. So blood is pumped through the artery. It goes to your tissues and organs where you, where you have perfusion. Okay. What's perfusion? The exchange of gases and also nutrients. nutrients and waste. Okay. So it goes to your tissues and organs. So now that, your, that the tissue and organs receive the, the blood supply and nutri nutrients, Blood is then returned back to the heart by way of veins. Your vein. Okay. What is this vein called? You have your small veins, but then the large vein in your heart is what? What's the, that called? The vena cava. The vena cava. Remember the vena cava? Okay, so from the vena cava, blood is returned into the right atrium. Atrium. Okay. From the right atrium, where does it go? Right ventricle. Right ventricle. Okay. Where does the blood go after that? Pulmonary uh, artery. 
of what? What? So it's going to go to where? It's going to go to the lungs. Because now, right now, here in the atrium and, and ventricle, it's not oxygenated, right? Mm -hmm. So the blood has to become oxygenated. Mm -hmm. So after it leaves the RV, it's going to go to the lungs. It's going to go to the lungs by way of the pulmonary artery. So after the RV, it's going to go through the pulmonary artery, which then will go into the lungs to become oxygenated. Once it becomes oxygenated, the blood is returned back to the heart by way of the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein. And then from there, where does it go? Left atrium. Left atrium, and then left ventricle, and the cycle starts all over again. Does that make sense? You like the flow? OK. <coughs> now, when we're talking about PE, obstructive shock, pulmonary embolism, we are talking about the pulmonary artery. There is an embolism or a blockage in the pulmonary of uh, the pulmonary artery that's preventing the blood to become what? Oxygenated. Oxygenated. If the blood's not getting oxygenated, excuses. What's happening here? Is this, are you having perfusion over here? No. You're not. <clears throat> so now your whole body is going to shut down. Your whole body is going to shut down because your body itself is not becoming oxygenated. Not just your heart. I mean, it's going to be your whole body as well as your heart that's not going to get oxygenated. It's not isolated. It's systemic. Your whole body is affected by this. Okay? So now if I go back. Okay. The causes of pulmonary embolism may be from pulmonary hypertension, arterial stenosis, constrictive pericarditis. What's pericarditis? Inflammation of the heart. Inflammation around the heart. Inflammation around the heart. So again, here is preventing blood flow from going to the lungs. Okay. Tumors that interfere with blood flow through the heart. Okay, so now you got also a tumor that's pressing up on that pulmonary artery and blood's not going to the lungs. Okay, so as in my drawing it says it originates in the venous circulation and is carried through the vessels to the lungs where it blocks one or more pulmonary artery. Because the pulmonary artery is blocked, the blood supply is not becoming oxygenated and therefore it's a systemic deprivation of oxygen, systemic, okay? Any questions here? If this isn't treated right away, it's what we call, have you ever heard that term sudden death? It's not football, okay? We don't mean sudden death in football. This is sudden death in the radiology <clears throat> department. So when you have somebody with a PE, we gotta find it and treat it immediately. But embolism is the number one, right? PE is uh, the primary uh, primary subcategory of obstructive obstructive um, shock. This is the most common obstructive shock we'll see in radiology. Yes. I mean, uh, do they have any warning signs like just like chest pain, chest pain, the chest pain? Okay. We'll do EKGs to see what's going on, and the EKG, although it may be the EKG will be negative. In other words, you're going to have a normal heart pattern. Mm -hmm. Okay, what you're gonna, and so the next indicator is with massive chest pain, there's probably a pulmonary embolism that's going on. You can, you can get an embolism almost anywhere, right? Embolism can occur anywhere. If it happens anywhere in your body, not such a big deal. That's right here. It's, it's here where, it's where you have this blockage, is where it is a big deal. You get embolisms in your legs all the time, okay? And you may get leg pain, you may get leg cramps, okay? But you've uh, got other vessels to supply blood down <coughs> to your lower extremities.
okay? But if this embolism goes into your lungs, life threatening. It's life threatening, and sudden death can happen. So the clinical manifestations of pulmonary embolism includes chest pain. Chest pain. A rapid, remember it's beating so fast that you're not going to be able to feel the pulse. Hyperventilation. Okay. Again, the pattern's here. Heart rate's going to go up. Respiration's going to go up. Blood pressure's going to drop. Urine output goes, goes down. But here are some other nuances. Okay. We already talked about difficulty breathing or fast breathing, fast heart rate, apprehension, you're getting the chest pain. You're getting the chest pain and lack of oxygen going to your head, so it's gonna cause the patient to be a little bit more anxious. There's gonna be a cough. What's hemoptysis? Spitting up blood. Coughing up blood. Okay, so hemoptysis is coughing up blood. Diaphoresis is excessive sweating. Okay. Syncope. What's syncope? Fainting. You feel faint. What's syncope? We already talked about the decrease in blood pressure. Cyanosis. I mean, this makes sense, right? Cyanosis is bluing in the skin. Remember I said a good indicator for cyanosis is you don't look at the body. You look at the nail beds. You look around the lips. You look in the earlobes. If it starts turning blue here, here, on the fingertips, that's a good indication that there's a decreased amount of blood flow going through the body. Rapidly changing levels of consciousness may also lead to coma and boom, sudden death. Overtime. Who scores first? Okay. Any for questions? I'm sorry. For the cyanosis, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned it just regarding the anything regarding the heart, but with the other ones you didn't mention cyanosis, but all of them they're blood they're all they yeah, down. so again. So these are all pretty much the same with any of the shocks. Okay. Yeah. All pretty much the same. No, it can also happen with it can also happen with the other ones as well. Okay. It's pretty much just lack of oxygen. Basically. Exactly. So again, lack of oxygen, you're gonna get cyanosis in, in any of those shocks. Or be very cold. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the other thing that is I didn't include in here, but it's also part of it is you may have um, uh, what do you call it? Um, cool, pale, clammy skin. Cold, pale, clammy skin. Okay. Lack of warmth. Isn't that the reason why? Because like the blood shunting the blood away from like the non-vital parts of the body and into the vital organs. So it's like, so it's gonna take away from your extremities first, right? And put it into your vital organs first. No, it, it all depends on where the, the shock originates from. Oh, okay. So it can be organs. It can, or it can be extremities last, or it can be. Uh, extremities first and organs last. It depends on where the um, the lack of distribution is. Gotcha. It can be localized or it can be systemic. So again, what are we doing? Stop the procedure. Okay, so the patient starts doing? complaining of chest pain, right? Can't breathe. Okay. The moment that they get chest pain and can't breathe, I don't care what shock it is. I'm gonna stop what I'm doing. It's not up to you guys to tell me. You're not doctors, right? So it's not up to you guys to determine what kind of shock it is, but you need to be able what shock is, period. Right? That's all you need to know. I've got chest pain, I can't breathe. I'm looking at the monitor, my blood pressure's dropping. My heart rate's going up. My respiration's going up. Those are the basic indicators of someone who's going into shock. We'll figure out where it comes from later on, but first let's stabilize our patient. Yes. In terms of what you're supposed to do, like um, for the different types of shock, for like sitting them up or not putting them in mm -hmm. the, I can't say the word, but the term. Trendelenburg. Yeah, yeah, you never put them in Trendelenburg. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the last thing you ever want to do. So they're either going to be lying down or sitting up. So in in terms of that, like, how do you know when you decipher to lay them down? We or always we always sit them up. Oh, okay. If they say they can't breathe. Yeah, we time. always sit them up. Okay. So I mean, uh, yes, yeah, so, supine so is indicated for some of them. Okay. But you're always going to sit them up okay. when they're conscious. If they're unconscious, you're going to lay them down. Okay. But the best position to always put them in, no matter what shock it is, is always going to be sitting up. Okay. Because we want them to breathe. We want to get their lungs full of air so that way the blood supply can be oxygenated 
and the tissues and organs don't suffer, especially the heart and the brain. Okay. All right. So again, stop what you're doing, get help, get the crash cart, be ready to assist, take vitals every five minutes, reassure the patient everything's going to be okay. Okay. And then your slight nuances. Is always be ready to perform CPR. Doesn't matter which one, you're always going to be ready. Okay? Any questions? About shock. A lot of information to absorb, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right. Diabetic emergencies. Diabetic emergencies. This also is very common in our department because most of the procedures that we do is we have our patients fast between 8 to 12 hours. We want their bowels to be empty. We want their stomach to be empty. We also withhold their eating. We have them fast because if they had, for example, okay, having them empty is one thing because we want to better visualize the, pop, the bowels and the GI system, okay? But also, the other part of having their stomach empty for a procedure is that if we, let's say we do an iodine procedure, okay, we have an iodine procedure and they become, they have an allergic reaction, what is one of the symptoms that happens when you have an allergic reaction? They throw up, okay? If their stomach is empty, they're really not going to throw up anything. If their stomach was full and then they had the contrast injection and they become nauseous and throw up, the likelihood of those contents going into your lungs increases. What is that called? Aspiration. Aspiration. If you're aspirating, very bad. Well, what happens to perfusion? Because now your lungs are also suffering, are you going to be able to intake a good amount of, of uh, oxygen in your lungs? You can't. Now you've messed up the efficiency of, of your lungs. So we even keep them empty because we don't want them to vomit and aspirate during the procedure. So there's a lot of patients who are diabetic. We have them fast 8 to 12 hours prior to the examination. So their blood sugar is going to be very low. Their blood sugar is going to be very low. What is low blood sugar? What's the medical term for that? Hypoglycemic. 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 So, in any radiology department, one of the questions that we ask our patients is that, are you diabetic? Not us, we're talking about the schedulers. The scheduler is going to ask the patient, are you diabetic? If they say yes, <laughs> they get the first slot first, second, and third slot. They're the ones that we do at the very beginning of the day because we don't want them having a diabetic reaction in our department. Okay? So, diabetic emergencies. Diabetes is a disorder of carbs, protein and fat metabolism, which also affects the structure and function of your blood vessels. Remember, your body, not only oxygen, but you also need carbs. Carbs is what provides you with energy, right? If you have, if you eat too much carbs, and you're not using up that energy, where does it go? Around your waistline, right? We need sugar, we need carbs for energy, okay? So diabetic emergencies is basically the lack or too much blood sugar in your, in your uh, system, okay? So the cause is a disturbance in the production, action, and utilization of insulin. Where does insulin come from? Pancreas. The pancreas. Insulin regulates your blood sugar. Insulin regulates your blood sugar. So the cells either stop responding to insulin or the pancreas stops producing insulin. Remember, insulin controls your blood sugar. Type 1 diabetes. 
First of all, your normal adult blood glucose level should be ranged between 80 to 115 milligrams per deciliter. 80 to 115 milligrams per deciliter. Type 1 diabetes is an abrupt onset, usually under the age of 30. Okay. It is a genetic condition. Here, the insulin producing cells are destroyed by an autoimmune process and the affected person must receive insulin by injection to control blood glucose levels to prevent <coughs> ketoacidosis. We're going to talk about ketoacidosis here in a moment, but it is related to diabetes. Okay. I also put down here in small script that type 1 used to be called juvenile onset or insulin dependent diabetes. Okay. Bolded. The body's immune system destroys the cell. It's an autoimmune disease or condition. So your body destroys the cells that release insulin. Okay? Eventually eliminating insulin production from the body. If you don't have insulin and it's not acting upon your carbs or your blood sugar, what happens to your body? You have too much sugar or not enough sugar? Too much. Too much sugar. You become hyperglycemic. Hyperglycemic. Okay, you become hyperglycemic. Okay, so again, it's usually under the age of 30 and it's genetic. Here's type 2 diabetes. So, there's a lot of stuff here, but if you look under the bold on the bottom paragraph there, this is essentially the body where the body isn't able to use insulin. So your body is producing in insulin, right? So here your body is producing insulin, but it isn't responding to it. It's there, but it's not responding to it. So this is also known as insulin resistance. As type 2 diabetes worsens, the pancreas may make less and less insulin, and then this is called <coughs> insulin deficiency. Insulin deficiency. Again, what is the end result here? Are you hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic? Hyperglycemic. Hyper, because again, your blood sugar isn't responding to the insulin. Okay? So you're going to have this large amount of sugar or carbs persisting in your body. <coughs> But this one's more self-inflicted, right? This one is cause, okay? So the question was, is self-inflicted? This generally happens, this generally happens with the overweight and obese. It's not genetic, it's lifestyle, okay? It's not genetic, this is lifestyle. So this may be controlled by weight loss, dietary control, and also exercise. <coughs> 